All right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. Um, we're going to do this the following way. We're going to start off um, with our guests, uh, Kanye Wigina Raja, who is uh, with me at the podium, UNDP's Asia Pacific Director, and Abdullah Al Daradari, excuse me, uh, the UNDP's repres resident representative in Afghanistan, who's joining us virtually from Istanbul. They will brief you on poverty projections for Afghanistan. Just before we turn to them, a couple of Afghanistan-related notes. Uh, at 3 p.m., as you know, the Security Council will hold a meeting on the Secretary General's latest report on the country and its implications for international peace and security. Deborah Lyons, the Secretary General's Special Representative uh, for Afghanistan, will brief uh, the Council on the situation in the country. I understand there will also be a civil society briefer, as well as Malala Yousafzai, who will brief uh, virtually as well. Um, in the Secretary General's report, he notes that the world is following events in the country with a heavy heart and deep disquiet about what lies ahead. He added that scenes of chaos, unrest, uncertainty and fear have caused alarm as well as trepidation for what lies in the balance in terms of hope, progress and the dreams of a generation of young Afghan women and girls, boys and men um the full report is on uh, is on the interweb uh humanitarian notes the world food program says it has reached more than 43,800 people in afghanistan yesterday wfp says that a hu un humanitarian air service flight yesterday brought unicef and uh, un uh, unama afghanistan staff into kandahar and on September 6th, uh, humanitarian air service cargo flight brought 22,440 kilograms of emergency medicine to Mazar Sharif for the World Health Organization. And UNHAS flights from Herat are also operating. Um, and that is it on Afghanistan. So I will now turn it over. Uh, to our uh, to our guest, starting off with Connie, and then we'll go to Istanbul. Welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, Steph. Great to be able to. Uh, you can, you, if you feel comfortable, you can take off your mask. Okay. Yeah. All right. Really glad to be able to interact with you, and maybe let me jump right in um, with saying that. Um, Afghanistan pretty much faces universal poverty uh, by middle of next year. That's, that's where we're heading. Um, it's 97, 98 percent, no matter how you work these projections. And we've used um, a lot of our data uh, that we had because we had done quite a few socioeconomic assessment studies for COVID to across the country uh, before the current situation. Um, plus, we're using a lot of the data that the World Bank and others uh, have also submitted. Now, the, the poverty rate currently is at about 72 percent. But what we don't talk about often is that quite some progress had been made on the development side. And I think I, I need to put some of that uh, back uh, on the table, uh, because the question often is, so were there any gains? What happened in the last 20 years? Now, per capita income more than doubled in that period. Life expectancy at birth was extended by about nine years. Years of schooling went from six to 10. And we got women into university. That's a huge, huge capability that's just not going to be taken away. Now, when we speak, we use this term compounding crisis. It's not compounding, it's compounded crisis because it's happened, right? So what does that mean? So together with political instability, you've now got a freeze on, on foreign reserves. You've got a collapsed public finance system. You've got a, a, a crush on local banking because of all of this. And you've got COVID, which we don't even now talk about, right, when we're talking Afghanistan. The numbers, as our WHO colleagues have told us, are not as intense as they were some months ago, but it's still very much there, 
uh, with the variants uh, brought on. And we've got a drought. So if you look at this, it's both a humanitarian and development disaster. I don't know how else to, to put it. Now, in the assessments that we, we did, we speak to four scenarios. It's a, a long a, um, escalation line, if you wish, of intensity and isolation. So it really depends now on the modeling was done based on how much the crisis and these other factors are going to rise in intensity, but also the reaction of the world to how much it will isolate Afghanistan or continue to engage uh, with it. So if you look at uh, the worst case scenario and then the, 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 the better case scenario, if one can uh, call it that, and I was just uh, speaking also with my uh, World Bank colleagues and they've done a similar kind of scenario mapping because we're working very closely um, together with them. So let's take a scenario where there is a complete interruption to world trade with Afghanistan. In just two months, with such a break, then we will see a 4% decrease and a 4% decrease in capital spending. This is to us and a complete disruption in connectivity. That to us means we're heading right to that universal poverty scenario. If some of this is, is more measured, then you see scenarios that are more at a medium uh, and a more manageable uh, scale. Now, you can't uh, address this with humanitarian relief alone. It's just not going to happen. We need short-term humanitarian relief, absolutely essential. But if it's going to stop people from fleeing, you've got to also save their livelihoods. Right? They've got to have a means of income at a local level. And that's where I would like to hand over to my colleague, Abdullah, who we're working with as UNDP to look at a local development shoring up uh, process for local communities so that basic essential services continue, livelihoods, particularly through small and micro enterprises, continue. And that's, you know, in, in Afghanistan, like in most places in the world, these are run and managed by women. And to look at whether we can continue to support small, the farmers with getting their winter crop up, with also drought and flood protection, while also working with seeds and fertilizer to that. So if I could call um, Stefan Abdullah to pick up the baton uh, from here. Great, Abdullah, thank you, uh, and please welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, to follow from uh, Candy's remarks, uh, the poverty uh, ink output elasticity in Afghanistan, meaning for each drop in GDP, we have a 1.9 percentage point drop in uh, increase in poverty levels with the expected drastic contraction in the economy by 13%, we can expect uh, almost a universal poverty level of 97%. Now, what, do, what should we do? And what should we do now? Because there is no time to wait until the crisis exasperate. The crisis is already exasperated. With universal poverty, there is no time to wait, and therefore, serving Saving livelihoods is as important as saving lives. In fact, saving livelihoods would save lives in a 97% poverty situation. Therefore, UNDP put together, as part of the UN response to the crisis in Afghanistan, we put together a package of local community resilience, supporting livelihoods, supporting jobs for young men and women, reaching uh, households that uh, have people with disability and reaching households with people above 65 years of age and making sure that we reach the 65,000 enterprises owned by women in Afghanistan and making sure that there is a million young men and women who find jobs in these difficult times. All of this will reach about 9 million Afghans. This package is mainly focused at the local level. It is mainly focused at the community level. How can we support the communities 
how can we make sure we are agile and flexible and working within the UN uh, family here to reach every child from zero to four years old, every person with disability, and every person above 65 years old. That would help us reach 97 percent, uh, sorry, that will help us reach 9 million people. But most importantly, we preserve through this package the gains of 20 years of economic and social development in Afghanistan. Because the, the Afghan population, by the time the events of 15 August happened, the Afghan population was already on the brink of collapse economically and socially. COVID and economic deterioration uh, have already made so many Afghans, the majority of Afghans, on the verge of falling into poverty. And now they are falling into poverty. And therefore, we would like to make sure that local communities in Afghanistan have access to finance, have access to support, have access to markets. We can make sure that through this package, the humanitarian assistance phase can be shortened and the resilience phase and the livelihood phase can start and kickstart early. There is no time to wait we, to end humanitarian to start resilience of communities. We have to start the resilience of Afghan communities today. And that is the essence of the program that UNDP is putting together as part of the overall UN work to save Afghanistan's development gains and make sure that the Afghan people not just survive, but also live in dignity, and they have the ability to choose their uh, futures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, first question will go to Edie Letter of the Associated Press. Edie. Uh, thank you both very much on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing. Um, this package that you were just talking about um, involves uh, a lot of businesses with women, interactions with the community. Have you had any chance yet to present this package or get an okay from the Taliban? And in any event, um, can you give us a picture of what universal poverty will mean for individual people in Afghanistan? Can you, do you want to take first stab at it? Thanks, E.D. And let me uh, say that we've been working on this package actually for the last six months. It actually was our plan B, right, which is to go decentralized. So we've taken our entire portfolio, uh, which worked at different levels uh, of the country, um, and moved it into a complete local level district-based system. So that uh, right now has been really running on a few things that we were already doing at local levels and continue to function. So if I look at the COVID response, um, that continues unabated. The work we do with WHO and the Global Fund on uh, the TB caseload, the malaria caseload, HIV caseload continues. So we are running on this and we've not let me say not yet, had to ask for national level permissions. We have been allowed at the local level as, as part of the UN humanitarian and development community to get on with our work. And let's hope that that continues because otherwise the bottom is going to fall off. And it comes right to what you said of what does poverty look like to the individual. And if there is you know, Afghanistan imports 75% of its electricity right now. And this is going to be squeezed. So to get solar energy going, which is also part of the package, to, to homes, to clinics, uh, to schools, um, to make sure that the distribution systems for essential services, and we are 
looking prim prioritizing health, but you've got water, sanitation, um, education, um, food. So the whole UN system here, it's, uh, you work the whole village right, to make sure that some of these just hold up. Because what, right now, what's holding it up are those micro businesses and the small farmers um, still keeping things going. Thank you. Uh, um, Abdullahi, would you want to add something? Maybe just to say that 70% and more of the Afghan economy is made up of uh, informal activities, and 70% of that informal sector is owned by women. And therefore, we need to focus on women in Afghanistan to prevent poverty, to prevent even uh, famine, because in this juncture, the relationship between SDG 1 poverty and SDG 2 hunger is very strong. We are looking at multidimensional poverty. And that means people will not only be poor, but they will be multidimensionally poor and they will be hungry. So the intervention is uh, uh, as, the, as humanitarian as one can think of in these uh, special and difficult circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Nichols. Reuters. Thank you so much uh, for the briefing. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, just out of those four scen scenarios, which one do you think is most likely? Are you able to project that? And you mentioned the frozen international assets. How big a role could that play in um, averting any of this, these projections? Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. I think for us, um, you know, we, we would love to wake up every morning thinking it's going to be the, the best case scenario. Um, I have never woken up any morning thinking it's going to be the worst case. So we're looking at hitting it somewhere in that middle uh, scenario. Because remember, it's both a case of intensity of conflict and isolation, right? Um, and we, we already see um, that um, there are countries reaching out, providing humanitarian relief. The borders are open, the, the land borders. We are starting to see not commercial flights, but humanitarian flights coming in. So supply lines are being kept open. So I would say it's in that, that middle uh, two scenarios uh, that we are, we are looking at without hopefully the dropping off uh, the, the cliff, but we're standing right at that edge. If we can get COVID uh, under uh, control, which means the COVAX facility has to move in fast. And UNICEF's doing an amazing job with WHO to bring in the supplies. UNDP then comes in in country to help then to administer the supply chain and, and uh, help it uh, to move. So we need the safe operating spaces um, and again, uh, right now, I have to say, it's there. And um, with Martin Griffith's visit, and you heard from him, um, let's hope that this continues to open up more and more spaces. On the international assets, uh, that, as you know, the, it, in fact, I think it's tonight that the G7 uh, foreign ministers, the finance ministers meet. This is a discussion that's, uh, that's uh, right at the center uh, of, uh, of their table. Um, and it will be um, a significant um, um, signal as to whether they're going to engage, how much uh, they, they will, and whether there are, if not through those means, other means in which to make sure there's cash injections needed uh, to keep the economy alive. Sorry, just a quick follow-up to that. Um, Martin Griffiths did mention the other day the emergency cash transfer program in Yemen that he said he hoped could be replicated possibly in Afghanistan. Is that sort of what you're talking about, about possible other cash injections? That's just one, and maybe Abdullah wants to come in here as well, because uh, this is we've, uh, we've done this in a number of countries, including working very closely with the World Bank and uh, other IFIs. 
um, because the, the UN does have a operating space um, behind humanitarian uh, uh, emergencies, right? So we can go in uh, and support and provide a bridging period um, until uh, the authorizing environment for the IFIs can, can kick back in. Um, so that is one means. Uh, but there's also direct means through uh, NGOs um, that can happen. I remember we were here 20 years ago, right, working both through NGOs, through the UN, uh, to keep things moving uh, until the formal structures uh, can come back again. Thank you. Uh, Feti? Uh, thank you very much for this uh, briefing uh, for both of you in New York and in Kabul. Uh, Istanbul. Istanbul. I'm sorry, Istanbul. <laughs> to be clear, it's Istanbul. It's Istanbul, I'm sorry. Uh, but just, I mean, other than the track of the humanitarian needs in Afghanistan, which there is no uh, doubt about it, that it is needed and it's urgent, let me get to the development side. Uh, the uh, human development numbers you presented are quite admirable, uh, taking uh, the situation, ongoing situation for the past 20 years. However, uh, when we are speaking about universal poverty, uh, there is lots of data that's been uh, discounted from the UNDP and all the UN agencies, with the exception of the UNODC, the, the Drugs and, and Crimes, uh, based on their uh, study released that 30, almost 38 percent, if I'm not uh, mistaken, of the GDP of Afghanistan derive from uh, poppy and uh, opium and heroin uh, manufacturing. Since 70% of the enterprises are women-owned, small to micro size, where does this uh, narco economy fit? Uh, uh, I understand the international community is eager to provide Afghanistan with all the aid and the finances needed to get through this period. But are we on the same time as international community providing Taliban with uh, pocket money <coughs> to spend since they were taxing the, the pop industry and, and the drug industry uh, before the U.S. was Fetty, would you I'm sorry. a question mark? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> what is the UNDP uh, planning to deal, and the other UN agency, if you can answer uh, on their behalf, dealing with the narco economy in Afghanistan? Thank you. Thank you. So let me say on the human development gains, right? I mean, these have been slow but steadily rising up. So you're very right. And those investments came because of the investments in things like health and education, right? And if you're doubling per capita income across the board, that's a huge gain. So the, you're right that there is a part of Afghanistan's economy that has been fueled by the opium industry, by, by illegal trade, by uh, drug trafficking and, and arms trafficking. That's not the area that UNDP has been working with. Um, that is uh, with ODC, with the, the DPPA, and uh, with a number of bilateral uh, partners. But this package we're talking about is very much a local economy package. And the micro-enterprises are basically running your, your food, your essential services. Your, that's, so we're talking about holding the bottom up here to grow and put back those assets that have allowed households to survive for... 20 years. So yes, there is the dark side of the economy, but that is not what this package addresses. But uh, uh, Abdullah, you want to speak to any uh, work, joint work with UNODC, etc.? Yes, can we, uh, first of all, we have the CBAR project, which is a project to replace poppy production by alternative agricultural and uh, rural value chain, and it's a, it's a successful project. One, we have exports before 15 August. Uh, CBAR products were uh, sold in the Dubai food uh, exhibition, and so on. So that is creating livelihoods for farmers, and we are relying on that and on those mechanisms to expand our local community development support. I'd like also to add one point, Kenny, on the question of the Afghan economy. There is, we knew that the official GDP figures of 20 billion dollars are much less than the actual size of economic activity in Afghanistan. And therefore, we, we now we understand in the current situation that classical top-down uh, uh, economic
economic packages will not work. And therefore, hence our focus on the bottom-up community resilience, which will sustain the economy until the moment when uh, such economic packages could be introduced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Betul Anadolu News Agency. Thank you very much, Betul Yuruk Anadolu Agency. Uh, thanks for doing this. I have a couple of questions. Uh, when Martin Griffiths uh, held a press conference with us, he also said that one Taliban official, a senior official, told him that uh, they also need guidance before they guide. Uh, their people. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, they reached out to the UN for any guidance, and you talked about uh, the role of women and their contribution to the economy, uh, but we also uh, saw the announcement from the Taliban leadership about uh, their interim government in, with no women included. Uh, do you have any confirmation about the abolishment of the Ministry of Women Affairs? I have heard exactly what you have heard on on that, and and that is a you know one of the the it is a deeply distressing fact if they've uh, removed a ministry that was actually doing an amazing job, and functioning uh, very well to support all of the the efforts of uh, of women in in and girls in uh, in Afghanistan. Um, on the overall engagement, this is where all of our senior leadership, um, and you will see uh, more senior leaders from the UN um, also um, heading in to keep engaging uh, with uh, the Taliban administration to make sure that what enables and, and uh, keeps us staying and delivering in the country, including for all those women and girls, because otherwise we go, we leave them behind. Um, then we've got to be make sure that the, both, not just their immediate uh, need for survival, but uh, just the dignity of being able to, to live in a way they, they have now been used to. This is why I say 20 years of investment is not going to be taken away um, by, um, by the current situation. So I hope we can stay in and continue to work to open up those spaces. Uh, which to me is a must. And as Feti said, this is not humanitarian relief. This goes to fundamental development and keeping those jobs and, and uh, um, opportunities for women and girls alive, I think is going to be absolutely critical. So we will continue negotiating hard for those spaces um, and to keep that moving across all of the regions in Afghanistan. But yes, if you ask me, I would I have loved to see more women, even in an interim cabinet. The answer is absolutely yes, there's no women there uh, at all. Uh, whereas we had, in 20 years, if you look at it, one-fifth of parliamentarians were women. One-fourth of the civil service that we worked with were women. That's powerful, right? And so we will work to get back there. Thank you. Um, Dossi Lembach, Pass Blue. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, you said, uh, I'm just looking at my notes, 70% of the economy is based on an informal sector, and most of that is, is done by women. Uh, so I'm just curious, what, what are the men doing? Maybe Fetty has the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, but Abdullah, you want to take that? Uh, uh, I can... I can uh, Testify that the uh, uh, Afghan women are very entrepreneurial, uh, very resilient. They are the backbone of the Afghan economy. And I'm saying this statement not like they are the backbone of the Afghan economy. So in any talks with the Taliban, we will be able to say it is not because we want to fight for women's rights. We do, and we will. But it's also in the interest of the nation to support these women. Uh, the new, there is a new social contract emerging in Afghanistan. And as it, is, it emerges, we need to make sure that women and young people are empowered enough economically so that they can take their role in that new social contract. Uh, and hopefully, with less fighting, uh, young men will also go to productive sectors uh, because women also have to play that role because most men were either involved in illicit informal economies or in the security sector on all sides of the conflict. 
let's hope that we see some normalization of economic activity and the labor market in Afghanistan. Okay, uh, any questions online? If so, open your microphone. Excellent. Uh, we will, uh, with uh, our thanks, release uh, Kani and Abdullah. Thank you for Ms. Stubble. Thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder, Abdullah al-Dardari is UNDP's resident representative in Afghanistan, currently sitting in Istanbul, and uh, Kani Wignaraja is UNDP's Asia-Pacific director. So thank you both. Thank you, Stubble. And just say one thing in closing. You may. Just to say that, you know, we've created, I think, a world with, with these separations of what we call humanitarian and development. And a woman sitting in a local community in Afghanistan is not thinking now, is this humanitarian? Is this development? They're thinking this is life. How do I save my family? How do I keep my kids in school? How do I find that next meal for the family? And that's the way we've got to look at it. And I really hope that although there are these kind of structural separations, um, this is a, a country team in, in Afghanistan that's really doing everything we can to work together. And so whatever the spaces we open up, whatever the agreements we reach, our networks with local NGOs and others, uh, we're sharing those so that we can get to all parts of the country and provide that support at that level where across all we, you know, today I think it was our, our C, HC in uh, Afghanistan was saying that right now from a security and access point of view, we pretty much are okay across almost all of the country. And so it's really Kabul that has to open up, uh, but the majority of the rest of the country will have us out there. So for me, the development work is as fundamental and immediate and urgent as everything else. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And um, I'll just start the briefing in a moment.